Welcome viewers to this set of lectures on Gandhar and Mathura art in Indian history and uh, to assist me through sign language uh, in this lecture, we have uh, Manisha Sharma uh, along with us and uh, she would be doing the sign language uh, assistance for this lecture. Uh, in the previous part of uh, this lecture, we have spoken about the historical correlates of Gandhar and Mathura art largely uh, about the uh, post Mauryan times, uh, about uh, the uh, kind of politics uh, that this particular period represented. Uh, because it is in this context that uh, Gandhar and Mathura art emerged uh, in the post Mauryan period. So, the timeline that we are dealing with is roughly uh, 2nd century BCE onwards. Uh, for Gandhar art, uh, it includes, it goes up to Gupta period, uh, that is middle of the first millennium uh, CE and for Mathura art, of course, it extends up to 12th century CE. So, uh, this is the time bracket that we are talking about, but uh, there are some distinct features of these two schools of art that we get to see particularly in sculpt sculpturing tradition uh, and uh, uh, Buddhism as it comes across to us and also particularly for uh, Mathura school we find that uh, several other uh, images, uh, sculpturing traditions uh, belonging to say Jain uh, religion and also Vishnuism and Shivism in as part of Hinduism, they are also uh, their icons, their gods, their goddesses are also uh, made uh, using uh, the techniques deployed by Mathura school of art. So, uh, most of the sculpturing traditions that survive or the form in which we get to see our gods and goddesses for the first time, they were rendered as such uh, by these two schools of art that flourished in the post Mauryan period. Gandhar, of course, is the name of a geography, name of a region and uh, uh, obviously uh, it, it represented uh, uh, a deep impact of Greco-Roman tradition uh, because uh, around this time it was the rule of Kushanas and all of us know that uh, in the post modern period uh, Kushan empire that emerged had its epicenter in Central, uh, Central Asia and uh, to the west of it of course it had a uh, very profound uh, Hellenistic impact. Uh, even otherwise, uh, post, uh, uh, post uh, Alexander, uh, there were several satraps and uh, we also have the rule of Shak uh, in the post Mauryan period. So, through all these agencies, there is uh, uh, the political context of Hellenistic impact or Greek impact or Roman impact that we get to see in this area. Uh, even uh, in terms of economy, there is a very thriving maritime uh, trade happening across the uh, Arabian Sea uh, and uh, the Red Sea uh, connecting uh, India, Indian uh, mainland uh, through its coastal areas to the mainland uh, in, in uh, Europe, so the Roman Empire. So, uh, that, uh, that uh, economic context also uh, lends credence to the robustness of uh, cultural contact that was very much there uh, happening in this area uh, of Gandhar, which is, uh, which is uh, right in between uh, the two land masses that we understand as India and uh, European world or uh, the Greco-Roman world. So, for Gandhar art, talking about it, we uh, in the previous lecture spoke that uh, there is a distinct Greco-Roman tradition, there is also uh, Indian uh, impact in terms of uh, thematic treatment of uh, the uh, religion and religiosity and mythologies, the animals, the plants represented, they are all drawn from uh, Indian history. Uh, 
there is also influence from China and Iran um, resulting into the formation of this style that we know as Gandhar art uh, and uh, the geography of Gandhar was such that it, ha it, it is located uh, at the intersection of all these places that we have just uh, spoken about. Now, uh, another dimension of uh, uh, Gandhar art is that uh, by this time, as we discussed in the uh, previous lecture, that Buddhism had uh, undergone uh, this uh, schism uh, into Mahayan and uh, Hinayan, and Mahayan Buddhism in particular uh, permitted uh, worshipping practices of uh, images in human forms. Uh, it had its own thematic articulation, uh, these uh, in the form of bodhisattva. So, the, this belief system, this new belief system that is uh, endorsed by Mahayan Buddhism is something that is represented, uh, that, that allowed uh, this sculpturing tradition to, uh, to express itself. Uh, had there been some kind of uh, some kind of a ban on uh, representing these ideas in human form or in anthropomorphic form then obviously uh, such tradition could not have uh, could not have uh, germinated uh, in, in this part of the world so uh, there is this pertinence of emergence of Mahayana Buddhism, which, uh, which had a, a different kind of uh, belief system permitting several new rites, rituals and belief system of bodhisattvas and uh, permitting worship, lay worshippers could go to uh, viharas and uh, they, they could go to chaityas, they could go to stupas and uh, there were decorative things uh, added to uh, the uh, uh, to the uh, to, to the Buddhist stupas and so forth. So uh, this required uh, some kind of a sculpturing uh, tradition to emerge, and Gandhar uh, happened to happened to be the answer to it. Now, uh, if you look at uh, what Gandhar is in uh, early Indian records, then uh, it's an ancient name uh, uh, of of a region that uh, uh, that lies uh, uh, somewhere around uh, i would say uh, pakistan today uh, northern part of pakistan uh, northwestern part of pakistan uh, to to be more precise uh, and also some parts of present day afghanistan uh, to its west uh, of course, is it, it is bound uh, in the western area by Hindu Kush uh, region, Hindu Kush uh, mountains, and to the north is the Himalayan foothills. So, uh, it, it is this area, this part of geography, that gets uh, named as Gandhar in early Indian records. Uh, and as uh, the location itself suggests that it was a point of cultural intersection, uh, say with reference to the Indian culture, the uh, Greco-Roman culture, the Chinese culture, the Persian culture. So, uh, they are all uh, in the vicinity and uh, Gandhar art uh, emerged as a school of art in this, uh, in this uh, tradition of intermixture, in this tradition of coming together of various cultures. In sculptural terms, uh, Gandhar is also the name given to uh, what emerged as a school of art in this area, in this region, uh, in terms of a sculptural and archi architectural uh, tradition. And uh, this could be seen uh, between uh, the 1st and 6th centuries CE. So, right from the uh, beginning of the common era down to the end of the Gupta period uh, is the time when uh, this school of art flourished, right. So, for good 600, 700 years, uh, we can see uh, the impact of, uh, uh, of or uh, we can see the uh, specimen of uh, Gandhar school of art. Now, uh, Talking little bit about the uh, excavation uh, history of Gandhar as to how uh, in the modern times we got to know about it. So, this is also very interesting. So, earliest excavation uh, in 1830 at uh, uh, Manikayala near Rawalpindi. Uh, where a stupa had been discovered by Elephantstone in 1808. 
So, Elphinstone had already discovered a stoop in 1808 in this area, uh, what we know as Gandhar, uh, but it was only in 1830 uh, that uh, near Rawalpindi uh, at uh, Manikayala, uh, uh, excavation uh, or systematic excavations were carried out, which revealed what we know as uh, Gandhar art uh, today. Uh, and it was the uh, French official Ventura who uh, was the excavator of uh, Manikayala. And please uh, understand that these were uh, uh, European officials who were working for uh, several uh, uh, local rulers or uh, the Rajas in India. So, uh, it was uh, the Punjab area that we are talking of and uh, Sikh kingdom that we are talking of and they were officials under uh, Maharaja Ranjit Singh as well. So, these officials uh, discovered something uh, of value and uh, it is Ventura who is responsible for Gandhar's acknowledged association with Buddha. So, earlier uh, this uh, finding or the finding archaeological findings at Gandhar were not understood with reference to uh, its association with the Buddha, but it goes to the credit of Ventura who uh, actually uh, understood the connect between the two, uh, because earlier uh, prior to this the, uh, the saying was that uh, this place from where these archaeological specimen are coming, uh, where the archaeological specimen of Sikandar and Sikandar happened to be Alexander's horse and this place was understood or in fact misunderstood as the resting place of Alexander's horse. So, this is uh, this tells you as to how uh, the surviving memory uh, goes on to embellish itself on uh, unspecified history and at times we uh, mistakenly understand quite a few archaeological uh, specimen as something else. And this is something with which we live uh, and quite true that we are living with quite a few misunderstood archaeological specimen even till date. So, uh, this, this is something uh, which is little interesting and I thought that I should, uh, I should talk about it. Prominent locations uh, from where uh, the specimen of Gandhar art can be found, uh, of course, are as you can see on your slide, Takshila, Peshawar, Begram and Bamiyan. Bamiyan was uh, in use uh, almost a decade back or more than a decade back uh, uh, when uh, uh, people uh, subscribing to uh, some other religion. Uh, who, who do not permit uh, worshipping uh, of human face or worshipping in the form of human face. They had defaced uh, uh, quite a few uh, uh, representations or uh, sculptural representations of uh, Buddha. So, uh, you must be uh, remembering that. So, these are the locations uh, from where specimen of Gandhar art can be found. Uh, the materials that were used uh, to uh, make uh, the sculptures uh, usually uh, in, in Gandhar were black stone and stucco. Stucco was used to plaster things, uh, not only for, for uh, sculptures, but also for uh, chaityas, viharas and stupas that are found uh, in good numbers around, uh, around uh, Gandhar. And as I said that Gandhar was just not uh, a stand alone uh, place of uh, artistic uh, or sculpturing tradition uh, or center of uh, sculpture making, but it was a very uh, deep entrenched uh, Buddhist uh, site. So, we have followers, we have Ashokan inscriptions, we have uh, several other associated findings, we have coins bearing uh, Buddha's image. Uh, so, uh, it was uh, a very, uh, you can say, flourishing Buddhist site uh, where we have several chaityas, viharas and stupas all located little away from the habitation area of uh, Gandhar, the city or cities around Gandhar. So, it was a, uh, it was a deep entrenched uh, uh, Buddhist place, you can say. 
and it is in this religious uh, context that uh, this art tradition emerges. Uh, and as I uh, just mentioned that uh, for, a, for some years we did not know about it and the association of the place with Buddhism is something which is uh, uh, wh which uh, got known to us uh, through some of the findings that we just uh, discussed about. Another feature of Gandhar art is that uh, its depictions are very realistic and natural. So, uh, whatever features are depicted in Gandhar art are realistic, natural and they are represented in perfection. Uh, and usually it is the uh, Buddha image, it is the image of the Buddha that is chosen to represent uh, this uh, realistic natural depiction with perfection. But this is not uh, all that uh, we have as a specimen because uh, some specimen from uh, some archaeological specimen from uh, Gandhar are also of Greek god uh, Apollo and even of some of the kings. So, uh, image making uh, of kings had also begun and uh, uh, all of us uh, are aware of uh, that uh, broken, uh, uh, broken head specimen uh, of uh, Kushan period uh, that, is, uh, that is usually found in history textbooks and so forth. So, uh, definitely uh, it, it is not only the Buddha who is sculptured as part of Gandhar uh, sculpturing tradition, but uh, several other Greek gods, particularly Apollo and several other kings also got their sculptures made uh, using this tradition uh, or using the expertise of, uh, of uh, sculptures uh, belonging to Gandhar area. Uh, just uh, running through the distinctive features of uh, Gandhar art, we have the halo behind the Buddha's head, that uh, circular thing radiating light or something. So that is very much there cast in stone. The matted hair which again is uh, uh, reminds us of the Greco-Roman uh, impact because that is very usual of the uh, Greco-Roman tradition to represent uh, human hair on head uh, in matted fashion. Uh, there are forehead lines uh, that are very distinctly represented. Uh, there are ornaments with uh, the help of which we can identify uh, whether a particular sculpture uh, comes from Gandhar sculpturing tradition or elsewhere. Transparent drape that the, the cloth, the attire uh, is transparent with several folds and, and uh, transparent in the sense that although it is a cloth, but uh, if it is hiding a muscle say biceps or triceps, then those muscles can also be seen or if it is uh, draped around the stomach area or the chest area, you can see uh, the other uh, physical features beneath that uh, uh, that uh, cloth. So this is this is something distinctly uh, uh, this is something distinct about uh, this sculpture and tradition, and it requires fair degree of finesse to 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 be able to uh, make sculptures with this effect. Uh, another very distinct feature of uh, Gandhar art is that uh, Buddha's image usually is uh, of somber countenance, sad countenance. So, he is uh, not represented as a smiling or very happy, joyful representation. When we talk of uh, Mathura art, we will see uh, that uh, Mathura uh, artistic tradition represents uh, the Buddha as uh, joyful. But uh, in uh, Gandhar tradition, it is a uh, little, a little uh, somber and sad. Talking of Mathura school of art, which is almost uh, of the same period from Kushan period down to 12th century uh, CE that we have already spoken about. Uh, here in Mathura school of art, there is very little of foreign influence that what can detect. Of course, it had uh, impact of the Gandhar sculpturing tradition. But direct foreign uh, influence in uh, Mathura school of art is something that is not very prominent. Uh, so, Mathura school of art in contrast to Gandhar school of art predominantly is Indian in thematic expression, in technique and also in the materials that were used. 
uh, and Mathura uh, can be identified with the present day Mathura uh, that all of us know about uh, in North India and we have evidence of again of uh, the Greco-Roman uh, impact in terms of the Kushan area extending to this, uh, this part of India Mathura area. So, obviously that political connect that we spoke of with reference to Gandhar and the, uh, the Bactrian uh, impact and the uh, Hellenistic impact they are also valid for for uh, for uh, mathura area also because uh, culturally uh, it is all integrated culturally uh, it's it's not aloof so it is in the same political and cultural ambience that we have mathura school of art also emerging but it has a personality of its own uh, in mathura school of art we have um, uh, sculptures belonging to uh, Brahmanical tradition uh, or Hinduism, uh, Buddhist traditions and Jain themes. Uh, so, idols uh, from uh, the Vedic uh, Hinduism or uh, subsequently the Puranic uh, Hinduism, they, they are all uh, represented uh, in, in uh, Mathura school of art and it is not only confined to uh, Buddhism uh, as uh, uh, as prominently it is in the case of uh, Gandhar school of art. Uh, then uh, about Mathura school of art one can also uh, say that the three dimensional effect uh, is, is uh, carved in very uh, bold relief uh, in, in, uh, in Mathura school. So, sculptures belonging to Mathura school of art uh, give you this feeling of uh, roundness and uh, girth. Uh, so, there is this uh, three dimensionality that can be seen uh, very clearly. The shoulders are broad masculine torso and right hand is raised in Abhay Mudra uh, position um, which is uh, um, so iconic of uh, Buddha, the Buddha. Uh, and as I said, uh, it also shows you the joyful continent, uh, countenance. Uh, so, uh, Buddha is not uh, uh, sad uh, or Buddha is not represented as uh, in, in a very somber mood, but in a joyful mood. By the time of the Gupta period, the sculpture shown uh, sharp and beautiful features, slim and graceful bodies, folds of transparent drapery, so something that was so distinct about the Gandhar art. By the time we reach the Gupta period, even Mathura sculptures started uh, adding these features in their sculptures. So, there is that transmission of uh, uh, of uh, uh, that uh, uh, that Gandhar tradition happening across time through uh, Mathura art. Uh, materials that are used in Mathura sculptures are spotted red sandstone as uh, opposed to what was used in Mathura uh, uh, sculpturing tradition. So, these are some of the high points in terms of features and other details about the two schools of art that uh, developed uh, in the post Mauryan period in Indian history and we also saw the other historical coordinates that influenced uh, flourishing of these two schools of art in Indian history and uh, the extent in time and area to which uh, these traditions continued. Uh, Gandhar school continued up to Gupta period and Mathura school impact and uh, uh, sculpturing traditions can be seen down to uh, 12th century CE in Indian history. Thank you.